we all need reminders, right? We all need reminders, like to grab the over-the-ear mic when you're preaching and you forget it and you last second have to grab the handheld mic because you're not quite, that would be a good idea. Yeah, thanks, Tanner. We all need reminders, don't we? This was totally not planned, all right? Or let's just pretend like it, yeah, well, yeah, there we go. It's Tanner's fault. Um, no, not really. But man, do we need reminders, don't we? I mean, I don't know about you. I mean, who's willing to admit this? Who's ever been in your vehicle, you're driving, and you're like, where in the world am I going right now? All right, your laughter says, yes, Josh is like, absolutely. Um, Josh, does that happen? Never, never, never. We're just going to keep going. Uh, it happens, right, with all of us. You know, I, I even have come to the place where I leave reminders for my reminders, right? All right? I mean, who, who does that, right? Um, but, you know, it's, it's a crazy world that we live in. And, you know, I got thinking about this. Technology is supposed to be helping with this, right? It's supposed to be helping us uh, be able to be on top of things and remember things. And uh, let's, let's give this a try here, guys. Are we on? Are we on? There we go. You know, I, I heard it said recently in regards to, um, in regards to AI, um, we're smart enough to invent it. We're dumb enough to need it. And we still don't know if we're doing the right thing, right? I mean, isn't that the truth, right? I mean, like we're smart enough to be able to invent it and, and to recognize that, um, oh my goodness, we need it um, more than we should, but yet we still are like, where are we? What am I doing and what's going on? You know, I'm not sure these tools are actually making us any smarter. In fact, I think probably the opposite is taking place. Um, I think we're... I'll just say less smart, okay? You know, like, we got talking about this in the office the other day. Like, how in the world, like, did, did, did people in Old Testament times, I mean, kids grew up, they, they had the, the entire Old Testament law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, memorized, right? Like, one chapter for us would be, like, amazing, right? They had all that memorized. And how many people, like the teachers of, of the Pharisees, religious leaders, had the entire Old Testament memorized? I mean, amazing, incredible. Like, I'm not sure our brains can do that stuff anymore. Like, what's going on? And I think this stuff is kind of contributing to, to really where we're at. You know, as I thought about reminders, though, you know, it's, it's like you ever leave a reminder to yourself, I've done this on my phone, and I look at it, and I'm like, what in the world does that mean? Like, I, I need somebody to translate for me. Don't forget to schedule your appointment. Appointment for What? Like, was it really that important? If it is, like, how come I can't really remember what it is, is even about? Man, we, we all need reminders. And so we're going to do this series called Central Reminders, not just because it's for us from Central Baptist Church in New York, New York, but just a reality for anyone who is a follower of Christ, we need core reminders, right? Key cogs of, of who we are as followers of Jesus Christ that are just so critical and so important that we need to come back to them time and time and time again. In fact, even the ones that we're going to look at here over the course of the next couple of weeks, if you were Jewish growing up in Bible times, you would recite these twice a day. Twice a day you would recite this. And really it's not so much about, okay, I need to remember this, I need to remember this, I remember this. It's more about I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to live out what we say we are doing. What we say we are all about. I mean, here at Central, it's right in the, the wall as you come in the doors, right? That we exist to make passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And as passionate followers of Christ, we need some of these key reminders. Well, this morning we're going to take a look at our first reminder in this series um, and it's going to talk about just what is so critical to us and it's it's really this reminder of loving God right of, of loving God that we are called to, to love God but before we even start to go down that road and I know some of you could probably figure out uh, where we're going and what we're going to talk about as you look at okay love God Matthew chapter 22 um, you can turn there. If you don't have a Bible, it's on page 483 under the Bibles, uh, under the, the chairs, the Bibles there that are before you. But, but there's this reality of loving God that, that we are called to do as followers of Christ. Now, 
I, I want to say something though that might sound obvious, but I think it's very critical and needs to be said. You know, there's a lot of people in this world that could claim they love God, right? Religious or non religious. Right? I mean, you, you might be, have people that are like not really religious at all, and they're like, oh, sure, yeah, I love God. Or you might have people from a, a variety of different religions that could all say they love God. So, what do we really mean as we are talking about our series here this morning about loving God? What does it really entail? And really, as we talk about this, the, the great litmus test for loving God is whether or not someone loves Jesus. And I want you to think about that for a second. And I want you to really think about what it means to love Jesus. Because even the religious leaders, the ones who had the Old Testament entirely memorized in Jesus' day, I want you to notice what Jesus says to them. In John chapter 8, He looks them straight in the eye and He says this. Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me, he says. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? Here's why. It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. I mean, talk about something to these religious leaders. You say you love God. You can quote the Old Testament word for word. And yet, if you really loved God, you would love me, Jesus says. So even as we start to talk about loving God, really we got to ask ourselves the, the first question, the litmus test there. Do I really, truly love Jesus? Do I have a relationship with God through Christ? Have I recognized that His sacrificial death on the cross was payment for my sin? Mine. See, if, if we have that recognition and recognize like, oh my goodness, Jesus died for me, and we have this transformational moment of coming to Jesus and saying, I want to give my life to you and I want to follow you, we can then answer that question that we truly love Jesus. We have to go there first before we talk about loving God to understand really what it means. Because you can't love God without loving Jesus because Jesus is God. Colossians 1.15 says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 3. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every, every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. For rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. If we're going to understand what we're talking about as we say we need to love God, we need to recognize first our need to love Christ as our God and Savior. Well, that being said, let's look at what Jesus said was the, the great commandment. Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 says this, But when the Pharisees heard that He had silenced the Sadducees, other religious leaders, right? Pharisees, Sadducees are religious leaders. We've said this before. It's just a good way to help you remember. The Sadducees are Sadducee because they... Anybody? Don't, they don't believe in the resurrection. Right, right. You've heard me say that before, and I, and I like to repeat that just to help you remember that, right? It's a good... Reminder. All right. The Sadducees are sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. So when the Pharisees, the other religious leaders, heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they come together like a huddle up, like, okay, all right, psst, bring it in. What's the game plan? How are we going to trip up this Jesus guy? 
I mean, we, we've got to stop him. He, he's really causing a lot of havoc. And so one of them, verse 30, 35, a lawyer, let's call him an expert in the, in the Old Testament, okay? Let's call him an expert in the law. Asked him a question to test him, all right? So he's a lawyer, he's a Pharisee, a religious leader. This guy is like top notch. And he asks this question to try to trip him up. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And I don't think Jesus had to think about it very long. I think it was very quickly that he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, all your mind. This is the great and first command. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. I mean, talk, talk about a couple of major reminders that we need in life, right? Love God, love others. Love God, love others. So you, you kind of know where we're going next week already, right? In fact, I'm going to tell you a couple weeks from now, as, as we get to June 2nd, we're going we're gonna to continue to look at some central reminders and we're going to talk about the Great Commission. These verses, right? This is the Great Commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. And, and as we get to June 2nd and June 9th, we're going to talk about the Great Commission. And, and we're going to have a special Sunday. You are not going to want to miss June 2nd, all right? If you've got to work, call off work, all right? All right? I'm not telling you to call in sick. I'm just saying get it on the schedule, all right? Be here. It's going to be a special day because we're sending out two teams that Sunday. We're sending out two teams to go and to be a part of the Great Commission. But the reality is, as we're going to talk about that reminder, we're all to be a part of it. Whether we're here or whether we're going abroad, we're to be about the Great Commission, which is making disciples, passionate followers of Christ. Well, as we talk about the Great Commandment this morning, I want to give you just a little bit of background. Okay? It, it's, the, it's the final week, right? The triumphal entry has taken place. If you follow Matthew's timeline in Matthew 21, the triumphal entry takes place. And Jesus then, that final week before he is going to go to the cross, he's in the temple each and every day. And he's teaching. And the religious leaders have kind of come together and they're like, we've got to get rid of this guy. Th this guy is just messing everything up. He's messing up what we've got going on. We don't like it. We want him out of here. And so they start to develop plans to get rid of Christ. In fact, even in our own text here in Matthew chapter 22 if you take a look at what's going on earlier in the chapter it says in verse 15 the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words and so they ask him a question about taxes I mean that's a great question to entangle people with right I mean taxes are never easy there's a lot of tricky things and they're like well who do we give to right do we give to Caesar to God and he, and he shows them a coin and he says whose inscription is it and they say Caesar's he says, then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And they're like, well, that didn't work. And so the Sadducees, then they come with their question about the resurrection. They didn't like the answer they get. And so now we come to our text here. And this lawyer, this expert, this Pharisee, who knew all about the Old Testament, knew all about the law, comes and asks him this question. Matthew 22, 34, 35, and then verse 36 asks this question, Teacher, which is the great commandment? Like, which, which is the most important? And, and you've got to recognize this isn't just a question about the law. This is also a question about what it means to follow Jesus. Because they recognize however he is going to answer is an answer for his followers, Right? So, so they're like, okay, what's he going to say about this? Because he's teaching all of these things and, and we don't like some of what he's saying. We don't like how he dissects some different things and explains some different things. So let's ask him this tricky question because it's got to either go with what we believe with the law or it's got to go with some, of, uh, some other things in terms of things for his followers. And so they ask him this question, which is really, yes, about the law. It's also about following Christ. And they're trying to trip him up. Which is the greatest? Like, Give us the top. What's the number one? Now, the odds are in their favor. You've got to understand this. 613 commands in the law. 613. They're like, 
We got him, right? He's got to pick just one out of 613. Really, was they couldn't even figure out which were like the most important commands and which were kind of lesser commands. In fact, they would categorize commands. There was mitzvot uh, kamaro, which is like serious, heavy commands. And there were mitzvot, which is the word for commands. Kalo, which is lightweight commands. And so they would even try to distinguish even amongst themselves like, all right, here's the ones that are like super important. These are kind of lesser. And maybe their thought was, you know what? I, I think if we were kind of in this situation, we might go right to, well, well, let's go to the Ten Commandments, right? Maybe one of the Ten Commandments. Maybe that's, that's one of the most important, maybe the most important. But the reality was this. Jesus had already taught that they shouldn't have this idea of lesser commands or lightweight commands. Listen to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, he'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And all the religious leaders are like, woohoo, that's us, we're all about it. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus has already taught about commandments. He's already taught about the reality that they are all important and that somehow their righteousness has to be greater than even that of all the religious leaders. So they're wondering, all right, what really is the most important? Don't just tell me the, the mitzvah camaro or the mitzvah kalo. Tell me of all 613, which is the most important of them all. And Jesus, by this time, has made them look bad time and time again. It's a matter of a couple of days before they're going to say, enough is enough. Crucify him. Crucify him. And they want to be done with Jesus. And so Jesus responds to a specific question, not with a general statement, but with a specific answer. He said to them, verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Mic drop, right? <laughs> like walks away. Done. He answers with a law that would have been recited twice a day, every day by every God-fearing Jew. Young and old. They knew this word for word. They would recite it over and over and over again. It's, it's known in the Old Testament as the Shema. And it was one of the very first passages that any child would have memorized. That parents would teach their kids right when they're little, the Shema. It was foundational to their relationship with God. And it's foundational for ours as well. To give you a little backdrop about where this comes from, it comes from the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, the people are about to cross over into the promised land. And before they do, God gives them commands, specific commands, laws that they are to live out that would set them apart as God's people, as Deuteronomy 6.1 Now this is the commandment. The statutes. The rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, Moses says, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it. That you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all His statutes and His commandments which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be long. He goes on in verse 3 and says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them. If you were, if you were at the men's breakfast 
here a while back, we, we talked about a passage that's really in connection with this going through in the next couple of chapters, really from uh, chapter 4 to chapter 8. Just talked about remember, remember, don't forget. Remember lest you forget. Here, be careful to do them that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. So, Shema. Shema. Shema is the very first word of the next verse here. Verse 4, O Israel. Shema, O Israel. Hear and do is really the idea of what it communicates. Hear, O Israel. Shema, O Israel. The Lord our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. This is what Jesus is referencing. If you're to study the Gospels, it pops up a couple of different times throughout the Gospels. I, I wanted to come back, and I know there's this whole deep conversation, diachronomy, diachronomy. We're going back to Deuteronomy to see what Jesus quoted here. And I want us to focus really on the entirety of what He's trying to communicate to His audience. He comes back and He quotes the Shema. He quotes the very words that probably these religious leaders and just about everybody, maybe everybody within listening distance had already quoted that morning. The words that should have been fresh on their mind that they should remember. He gives them these words that they could have recited right along with Jesus. This lawyer, this religious leader, he would have known how important and how foundational these words were to the Jewish people. And he says, you're right, teacher. You're right. The Hebrew words used in Deuteronomy chapter 6 there with the Shema tell us more than we first recognize in English. That word Shema, as I said, it's the word hear, but it's the idea of both hear and do. It's not like Let's be honest, sometimes we do this, right? We come to church and we're like, man, that was a good one. Let's go have a good week. And, and we don't really even come back to it. And I'll put myself in that own category. Or I'll be the leader of that group, all right? It's the idea of hear and do. Make it a part of your life every day. Shema. The word for love in verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God. Love is the word ahava. It, it, it's, it's not so much about feeling, but it's action. The word heart that's used in Deuteronomy 6, 5. It's the word lavav. It's not about emotion, but it's more about actually mind and thoughts and centering our mind on God. That everything that kind of comes through our grid of thought and action in terms of love is concerned that it's through this grid of the Lord. Nefesh is the word soul. It's not, it's not your spirit. It's your entire life. It's, it's every part of who you are. And that last word, might, that's used in Deuteronomy 6.5 is the word meod. It means literally, if we were to literally translate it, it's all your very. And so we're like, okay, we don't really have a, a word that really describes that. Mayod. And so we just we, we generally translate it either might or strength, but it, it is really like saying all of your oomph, if you will. Like giving it your all, your oomph, putting every ounce of of energy, every bit of energy that you got. And when Jesus is saying we need to love with all our heart, soul, strength, He's communicating that the greatest thing we can do is to love 
God with everything we have and everything we are. It takes me back to a series we did, I believe, about 10 years ago. Love God more than anything or anyone. In fact, the Shema, it goes, it goes on how to describe how this should be so vitally a part of their lives. It says in verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down when you rise, you, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. If you've ever seen Orthodox Jews with, with, the, the, with things wrapped around their arm and their wrist, literally they'll put a piece of this on paper and they'll wrap it right on. They take this like extreme, okay? As frontlets between your eyes. They'll put like a little box that's strapped to their head and it says you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And you've probably seen it. In fact, I've, I've said this before. Like if you were to go to a hotel in Israel on every room in that hotel when you walk through the door the the shema it, it's right there it's 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 written there in it um uh, right on the doorpost it's there everywhere you go they take this extreme and it's really not as much about written on your hand or on your forehead the frontlets between your eyes on the door it's more about everything we do in every part of our day should be a part of loving god with everything we have I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I think probably for everybody in the room here, there's this reality of when we read, you shall teach them diligently to your children, where it's like, Ugh. man, is there room for improvement. She'll talk of them when you sit in your house. Man, we talk about a lot of stuff, but not enough about the Lord. Or when we walk, by the way, when we are in the vehicle, right? when we lie down, when we rise, it's the reality of as we spend every, each, every waking day of our lives, each and every day should be this reality of we are thinking and, and we are pondering on loving God. This is why this is the most important command. Because it shapes every part of your day and it shapes everything that we do. Everything that we think about and ponder on. And I want you to catch what Jesus says at the end of it. Verse 38. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. On these two commands hangs all 613 other commands in everything that the prophets talked about. Everything that Moses and Elijah and Isaiah, everything that David wrote about in the Psalms for us. Every bit of wisdom that Solomon gives to us, right? All of it depends on loving God and loving people. It summarizes it all. You know what's really neat about this, this command here? It levels the playing field for us, doesn't it? If you're the type A moralist, it ruins your ability to stand above everybody else in your mind. Sorry, right? And, and if you're the person that's got that shady background and you've had things in your life that you're like, man, I wish I could forget that that even took place and you got these kind of dark secrets in the closet. Listen, it places us at the table, doesn't it? It gives us that seat. It puts us on a level playing field. Take note of this command that Jesus shares in Matthew 22. It's not an imperative. It's indicative. It's... Uh, it's, it's not you do this, it's you be this. So what does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus? 
a passionate follower of Christ. Well, it starts with this great commandment to love the Lord with everything you have, with everything that is in you. It's kind of neat to think about this because as you do, it, it, as you think about your love for God, it begins at conversion, right? It begins at that moment that you give your life to Christ. And yet it grows. The more you know about God and the more you follow the Savior, and you know, we just went through Psalm 23, right? The closer you are to the shepherd and the more you really study His ways and learn from Him and allow Him to lead your life, the more you love Him. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that, that everything's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we won't go through the valley. It does mean that there's going to be times where we wonder, where is God and what is He doing? But the reality is, as we consider this truth about loving God with everything we have, the more it'll grow and grow and grow and grow. I thought about it in terms of... Um, of myself and, and, my, and my wife, Candace. Truth is this. I love Candace way more now than when we got married. Okay? Now don't take that wrong. Alright? That's not like we get to, to the wedding day. Um, and we're, we're coming up on 24 years in, in a couple months here. Right? It's, not, it's not like when we, when we came to that wedding day, I was like, well, I love her a little bit. Let's get married. Right? No, that's not it at all. I, I loved her. I loved her deeply. But my love now is way greater than it was 24 years ago. Way greater. It's way deeper. It, it's to an entirely different level. And the more you love someone, the deeper your love grows for that individual. And the same is true for God. The more that you spend time with God, the more that you ponder on His Word, the more that you just sit in silence and you just enjoy the greatness of who He is, the more you just sit and observe creation. I, I'd encourage you, get up in the morning, and, and if you have a place kind of kind of where you can get out and just listen to the birds, just listen to the birds. Just observe God's creation. The more that you ponder on the greatness and goodness of your God, the more you will fall in love with God. And even when we go through the valleys, those tough times should spur us to love God more and more and to be closer and closer and closer to Him and to lean into His presence. I, I want to kind of take this idea of loving God here and, and, and I want to just separate it for a minute and talk about a couple of different areas, okay? Some of us are, are wired to think about Loving God in terms of what we do, right? And you would be right, right? I mean, we, we've said this word is, it's, it's the idea of action. And we tend to go to passages like this, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them, right? Or John 14.15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And, and some of you are wired in that way. Do, 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 do. That's how we are going to show our love for God. And to a certain extent, you are right. I mean, as I thought about this, I thought about the end of the Gospel of John. Three different times, Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And it says Peter was grieved. I mean, he's just cut to the heart. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. And there's certainly a doing component of that. But there's also a being. In fact, even right at the very end of that passage, Jesus says to him, the very same words that Jesus first uttered to Peter. Follow me. See, loving God has everything to do with what we do for Jesus. But what we do for Jesus comes from our being 
with Jesus. I mean, my mind quickly went back to 1 John and, and going back to a certain word that we focused on in 1 John. It's that idea of abide. Because love is, is both action and affection. It's, it's doing for God and it's being with God. 1 John 4.16 says, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in Him. Loving God comes from our being with God. It comes from our affection for God. And the more we spend time with God, abiding in Him, and in awe of Him, the more our love for God grows. See, love is seen in both action and affection. And what Jesus demands from us or commands, as we see in Matthew 22, is not so much decisions of the will, but deep, profound transformation of what we treasure of what we love. I mean, this, this really got me thinking this week. What do I really love? And we start to answer that by what we do and where our time is spent and by the words that come out of our mouth. We start to really think about, do I truly love? And really, the question is, do we truly love God? Do we, do we love Him with every ounce of who we are? Do we, do we treasure Him more than anyone or anything in this world? I, I mean, do, do we spend time in God's Word um, because we love Him and want to be with Him and want to commune with Him? Or do we spend time in God's Word and, and simply check it off the to-do list of things that we know we should be about? There's a massive difference between those two. And i got to tell you, from time to time, I think I drift from one to the other. Where I'm going through the motions, and I'm doing it, and whoop, check that out, they got that, all right. Yep, reading through the Bible in a year, so I got those chapters done, awesome, and I move on. And then there's times where I really sit and I ponder about what I'm reading and how that impacts my life for where I am right now and for what's going on. See, the more we grow to love God, the more we love being with God. And the more we love God, the more, the more we love loving. Where it's, where it's not just a command of doing what we know we're supposed to. We're supposed to love our enemies. So I'm just going to love them. Now there's a massive difference between that and love, loving to love others. Do we really love loving? Loving God is very much connected with being more like the Savior. In Romans 8, it says this. Very familiar passage. But I want, I want you to catch this in terms of the love of God. And we know that for those who love God. For those who love God. I mean, we just skip right over that, right? We read this verse and we think, and for those who are saved. That's not what it says. And for those who made a decision... We know that for those who love God with all their heart, soul, and mind, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. For those who love God, He conforms us to the image of His Son. Let, let me ask you, 
If you love God so deeply that you desire to be conformed to the image of His Son. To, to change the desires that are on your heart and mind. That, that where our, our minds tend to, to run in those moments where life slows down and we have a minute to catch our breath, do we really desire to love God or to allow our minds to go in all these other places that are way less significant? Do you, do you love God with all of your love of, including your minds and thoughts? Do you center your thoughts on Christ? Think on these things, Paul says. Do you, do you love God with all your nefesh, with all your soul, with every part of who you are? Do you love God with all your mayot, with all of your umph, with every ounce of energy that you have? Do you love God? See, the reality is, everybody's got a whole lot of room to grow, don't we? When Jesus is saying we need to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, or even strength. He's communicating that the greatest thing we can do is to love God with everything we have and with everything we are. Church, we, we need this reminder. Reminder number one, essential reminder number one, love God. I want to challenge you as you go through your, your week that you really contemplate, that you contemplate strengthening and deepening your love for God. I mean, I mean, husbands, listen, if I was to challenge you, if this was a message about uh, marriage, and I was like, listen, I want you to go out this week, and I want you to show your wife that you love her. Your brain could run to a bunch of things. Listen, listen, church. Those of us who really are truly followers of Jesus Christ, let's go out this week and let's deepen our love for God. Well, our heart, soul, and mind. God, we need reminders. And we need you, Lord, to, to, to show us and to help us recognize, uh, Lord, really where our, our love is really at. God, I, I know even just studying this and preaching through this, God, it, it just brings great convic conviction upon my own heart and mind of my need to deepen my love for You. So God, strengthen us to do that. Strengthen us to live this out. Strengthen us, Lord, to consider, to, to hear and do the Shema of loving God with everything we have. Lord, I pray for those that are struggling, that are going through difficulties and in seasons of struggle, I pray that they would be reminded that You are there. And I pray that they would just love You even in the, the tough times. I pray that their love would, would grow deeper and deeper and deeper because of the difficult seasons. I pray for those that are not followers of Jesus, that they would recognize their need first and foremost, that litmus test of loving Christ as their God and Savior, the one who died for their sin. God, strengthen us. Equip us. Conform us. Transform our hearts and our minds to love you more. We ask and we pray this. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen.